Uh, well, I was going to talk about myself some more, but I really like the theme of this uh, conference so far about the burnout and just understanding like what it means to do our job. So uh, instead of talking about my experience of that, I'll just share like my own personal experience and dealing with stress and stuff like that. So yeah, like uh, my favorite thing to do to clear my head as soon as I leave the office is I hop on my Harley and I buzz the longest way around to get to my house. Clear my head out. And then, it, you know, I do like going to the gym. Uh, uh, to me, I, you in our job, we think a lot. So I also need to challenge my body. So I, I do as much gym as I can. And uh, yeah, and I like to spar, you know, go, go punch people, you know, that, that helps. You can't punch them at work, go punch them in the gym. So I, I highly encourage just finding those activities. And yeah, pistol shooting, blow some shit up. Like, that's awesome. Like just go shoot some exploding targets. And then now recently I'm a new dad. Uh, I have a five month year old son. And when I get home, I look forward to reading the Lord of the Rings too. Yeah. So, it just cleans my head out. So with that, uh, and move into some network segmentation. Um, so I've sat in, in many conferences like this. I've, you know, gone to workshops, booth camps, whatever. And they always tell you, man, you gotta, you gotta segment those networks. You gotta protect it. You gotta minimize your blast radius. You gotta do all these things. It's really good. And it is, it's important. But I'm always sitting where you're at and I'm like, all right, how? How do I do it? Like, so uh, there's uh, so many uh, different things that you hear when you're listening to them. So you may hear like a network engineer or a cybersecurity engineer, the network engineer is always like, yeah, man, when you build networks, you want to make them as efficient as possible, you want to make them available, you want to monitor, you want to do all that. It's all very important stuff, but you don't hear them talk about cybersecurity. You know, they don't talk about how you do that securely, at least not all of them. Some of them do. This isn't a general statement, just some of my own experiences. So then you, you go to the, the next session, you see a cyber person. They're talking like, hey man, well you gotta, you gotta use multi-factor, you gotta use uh, data encryption, you gotta put in firewalls, you gotta do all these things to protect your network. It's great. They're not keeping in mind all the performance part that the network guy seems to care about. So you gotta bring it together. You know, it's all important to network segmentation. And I think some of the disconnect uh, is uh, related at the educational level. Perfect. And the reason why I say that is I've, I've gone through, probably like a lot of you have, I've taken different certifications, I've taken a lot of classes, I've read a lot of books. There's a lot of definitions for what network segmentation is, but the, the three most common, starting with the top one, is typically the network definition, the network person definition of network segmentation. And that's breaking up broadcast domains. It's great. That's not all of it. Um, you, you know, then you read another book. It's maybe it's a more security related book, and it's saying, "Hey, you got to limit traffic between those broadcast domains or those segments." It's great, but it's not the whole picture. And finally, I found a definition where it did both. And I was like, and "This is the one I like." But the problem is. For at least in my world, in my experience, it took me a higher level of training myself before I finally found this definition. This comes out of the CISSP book. You know, for me, that's not where I'm starting. When I'm in college, I'm not starting that level. If you are, fantastic, not me. I worked my way up the chain. So for the remainder of this presentation, when, we, when I'm talking about network segmentation, I'm going to level set, and I'm going to say it's about breaking up broadcast domains, and it's also about controlling that traffic between networks. So again, how do we do it? As Fred indicated, business needs are very, very important. It doesn't matter if you have all the technical skills, the technology to do it. If you don't understand what's important to the business, it's hard to know what needs to be protected, right? So starting with uh, data classification is very important. 
you need to sit down and understand what are the things that the business relies on. Sit down with your data center teams, sit down with your managers, your stakeholders. Hey, if this is compromised, this is exploded, what's that do to the company? So it's it's very important to understand that and that, and understand like to live within your means as a company. And, and again, like a lot of what's been talked about is getting your decision makers to understand those things. But most of the time, money talks. So if you're cognizant of the money when you're talking to them, chances are if you have a, any level of decent networking gear, there's a lot you can do with what's already there. It doesn't have to be complicated. So living within your means, and sometimes it is a lack of personal skills. Um, maybe you're a small IT department. Maybe you only are a networking person. Maybe you don't know from a cybersecurity. So maybe that means you got to get more personnel in or get more training to help better understand what the goals are and kind of achieve them. And all that kind of leads to time. So if you're, you know, you're a very capable, smart IT person, but you don't have all the skills necessary to segment things off, well, that's a lot more time you gotta spend researching and learning and getting, you'll get there, but it's just a lot harder. So at the end of the day, understand those needs, understand what you what it is that you're trying to protect and work with your upper management to build that into the budget, uh, into the roadmap. So eventually it doesn't have to all happen in one day. I've been doing a network segmentation project at my company going on for years. You know, it's an, it's an always going project, right? So just try to get it in that business plan, get it on the roadmap. So now we kind of understand like, okay, we know what our needs are. We know we need to segment this stuff. Again, how, how are we doing it? So to me, it starts with your philosophies. It's like if, if there's coders in here, we all know when you code, there's different styles, right? Networking is the second way. My philosophy, I'm not saying it's the right one, it's just how my brain thinks. In my head, I'm like, if an air gap network is the most segmentation I could ever possibly put into something, how close can I get to doing that with technology? Right? So VLANs. That's why VLANs were made. Break up, we can't afford to put a switch for every network, so we invented VLANs. Well, that's not enough from a security standpoint. VLANs, unless you don't have any routing between them, are insecure. They, they will route, they're, you know, they're directly connected, they'll go to each other. Um, and then you still have potential for VLAN hopping, which is a very low risk thing because it requires you to have direct connections and stuff like that. But there are things to just keep in mind. So on top of, okay, how close can I get to air gapped? Zero trust architecture. That's something that is a very big, very wide and very deep topic. And I'm only really going to cover one piece of it, which is related to network segmentation. But uh, from a, a CISA document, I just wanted to share what the definition is. I'm not going to read all that to you, but I'm just going to say zero trust. And the point of it is you don't need access, you don't get access, and you're all legal. Okay, So you don't let things have access that don't need it. The zero trust architecture, in a nutshell, is your plan, how you do it. <coughs> so out of that system maturity document, they break it down into five pillars. So as you can see, networks, networking or network segmentation is one pillar. So there's so much, and I wanna just talk about this model because you can actually probably have multiple sessions on zero trust and all these different levels of zero trust. And to me, it's like shooting to the moon of impossibility to ever achieve it. <laughs> but the goal is, is just to, to be better, right? And by the definition of what this document that I got this out of is, everything is completely automated. So what I'm going to talk about from a network standpoint, the basics, it's not automated. So like, for example, if I say only this computer can talk to this thing on this port, 
that's you know zero trust. I've only given it minimum access, right? But that access is always open. And a fully mature model that would just close down and only open up when it's needed, close back down, open back up. And that goes from user permissions, devices, your data access, and all that. Again, I'm just going to focus on uh, networking loops, network segmentation. And again, it all boils down to understanding what those critical systems are, what that data is. Again, you got to know what it is you're trying to protect. And that was something that took me a hard time to really get my head wrapped around. Okay, I know how to segment networks, but I don't know what to put in them. So, uh, and then always keep in mind that zero trust, that implicitly deny is so much easier to shut the water off, block it, and start poking holes than it is to leave it running and try to shove napkins in the hose or whatever it is you're trying to do to block stuff. You can't always do it that way in a perfect world, but keep it in your mind that that's how you want to roll, build it into your plan. Um, so when you're looking at this model, again, what I'm going to talk about gets you to about, I'm pointing over there because I see the slideshow <laughs> behind me. Uh, so when you see the traditional to initial level, that's kind of where I'm talking, which is the bottom two tiers. The advance is that fully automated stuff. So you could look at that document. So it's an interesting read. Seems impossible. I'd like to talk to the guy who's achieved all of this and buy him a couple of beers. Um, so getting more into the fun part of this, now I'm done talking about the, the business and the philosophy. One of the key components to network segmentation is your IP subnet design. And I think this is something that is strongly forgotten about a lot. A lot of people don't think about it. My biggest pet peeve as a network engineer is bit boundaries and people not following them. They're there for a reason, folks. They make your life easier if you follow them. And it's something you're taught very early in networking. And all the advantages of having good subnets and good subnet masks is when I'm creating ACLs to filter traffic or security policies in a firewall, if I'm following bit boundaries, I don't have to think about it. I can be like, slash 16, that permits everything I need it to do. If you're overlapping bit boundaries, and I think I blame marketing salespeople for the home equipment industry because we all know every router that you ever buy starts with a DHCP scope, starting at 100 and going to 200. It is completely overlapping so many bit boundaries, it's insane. But if you clean that up, when you're writing your wildcard masks or subnet masks, it just simplifies it so much, especially if you're dealing with a lot of ACLs, because mistakes will be made when you're overlapped, because you're like, well, in order for me to permit this, I got to also allow this thing or I got to move it, something like that. So it just takes a lot of the worry and the thinking out of it. So here's an example of how I structure my subnets. This is my world up here. You do it however you want to. This is just how I'm suggesting it. I'll try to use this laser pointer a little more. So up here, I just broke this out into the four, the four octets. The first octet, it's whatever. Just 10, 192, 172, whatever you want it to be. I always like to use the second octet as my VLAN ID. All right? And then my third octet, that's I always figure, it always ends up to geographical location with me based on my job. So it's like a site ID or a location ID. And then, uh, so over here, we're talking about octet two. I got my user group. VLAN ID 16, the, they teach you in school, well, here, make it easy on yourself. If it's 16, your VLAN ID is 16, right? Sometimes it doesn't always work out. And sometimes my philosophy is if I got these one-off things like IoT or guest that I want to make sure that I'm always cognizant of, I make them some obscure number just so when I see it, it clicks a lot faster, right? I'll, again, I don't like to think. I want to be able to see it, and I just want to move, yeah. right? because we're all in a hurry. We all got shit to do. And the same over here with the site location, that just identifies my office. So when I'm building a subnet, 
I can say 10.16.64, that's the user VLAN at the HQ office. 10.16.96, that's the user VLAN at the remote office down the road. So now when I'm writing my security policies or my ACLs, and I've got to build that wall card mask, and I say, I need to filter all users. I don't want them going this way. Slash 16, bang, it's done. Now, are you covering a lot more subnets than you're not using? Yes. But again, it's easier and it's not perfect. I'm not saying it is. It just makes it easy. But if I want to separate HR because you know they deal with a lot more sensitive data, well, I can lock them down um, by 24. So I can still say 10.16, they're using their HR, they're 24. No 10.16.4 network can go out. And that locks them down a little bit. And I, I've shown some examples here. I'm not going to talk about them too much, but like uh, I, I have a heavily routed network, so I have a lot of point-to-point -point networks. And this is how I build them out. You know, I just have three to four VLAN IDs that I repurpose uh, for my dynamic routing and whatnot. So moving forward, that was a little bit of the logical. Let's talk about the physical design. <coughs> Excuse me. So as I said earlier, I want to get as close to air gapped as possible. So if this is air gapped, how can I get there? Okay, we've all seen this diagram right around a stick. <coughs> so on the left, yeah, without routing, you got your switch, your flat switch, and you got three networks there. There's no routing, they are segmented. There's nothing, there's no way they can communicate. So in that case, I mean, if you can live your world like that, that's perfect. You're not gonna be able to. Chances are you got users that need to hit some server. Uh, probably guests will never touch your users or your servers, so you completely block them off. They never need to be routed except to the internet. But when you put it with routing, you'll have to use some ACLs. Um, so I want to expand on that a little bit further. So I got two examples that, that I've used a lot. So that's a layer three switch, if you're not familiar, right there, um, with uh, switch virtual interfaces, right? So at this level, I'll use ACLs to control my traffic. I know I'm not gonna make too many changes to guest. I'm just gonna block it, let it only go out to the internet and takes care of them. Servers are a little, gonna be a little more pain in the butt with ACLs, because what well, ACLs are stateless, right? So that means whenever I allow out, I have to build something on the other side to allow it back in uh, to respond. But then I have routing up here to my switch, and I always prefer routing over layer two extensions, because that gives you more traffic control and traffic monitoring. So when you can, do layer three links between stuff. <laughs> Don't extend out. You're just asking to extend your threat landscape by too much. Uh, I'm a networking guy first, cybersecurity guy second sometimes, so I like to design things like that. With firewalls, you you know, you can, whoops, wrong button. Uh, you got the DMZ up there typically. That's controlled by like your security policies. You want to keep that removed. Now, one point, you know, say I like to use firewalls versus ACLs, which I do. You could say move these networks up here and use security policies. It's a lot easier to manage, but you are sitting on an edge firewall, which feels iffy to me. So you might put something like another firewall here instead and control it with. Um, security policies on the firewall, which are stateful, so you make it and you move on. You don't have to like account for both directions of traffic. You may not be able to read everything that's on here. It's just more of a representation of what I do. So in my world, I have a lot of layer three switches geographically spread out different networks. You, it's not feasible to put a firewall at every single one of those locations. It's, it's just not. So how do I force traffic back to a firewall back at my headquarters, right? I build virtual routing into every single one of these, overlay it uh, with another OSPF, 
dynamic routing instance or whatever, and I force it to go uh, through this firewall and back out to the global routing table. I only do it, and it's just kind of bring this whole thing full circle. I'm only going to go through that effort of VRF routing for networks that I know are the important ones. I don't care about guest network. That could be the wall of the west. So I'm just going to block it using ACLs everywhere because I know once I do that, I don't have to mess with it again. Whereas my server networks and my user networks are constantly changing permissions. You get a new application, you get another server, you get something new. You got to update those ACLs is a nightmare. So it is actually, in my mind, a lot easier to build virtual routing, force it all to one firewall. Hopefully I never have to touch the virtual routing ever again. And then now all I have to do is create my uh, firewall policies. So in this diagram here, I just have some redundancy built in just to kind of show some examples. I'm not going to get too far into that. Um, so these are my credits, my resources. I work. I try to work in facts. I try to back up what I say. Um, so I'm not inventing anything new. I'm just trying to figure out how to make it all work together to my advantage. And I know I blew through that really fast because <laughs> uh, I could keep going. But has anybody got questions? I think I have like time for one. Got a minute or two. Okay. I'm going to talk about any of it. Perfect. No kidding. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait. Works for oh, sorry, sir. Your virtual routing, is it open source or why is there actually a way So, I'm a Cisco bitch. <laughs> so, so that's all Cisco here. <laughs> so I'm using uh, VRS on Cisco. Or is that personal? I mean, Dude, I've been working on Cisco since I first started doing networking. I could do something else, but if my if the company's going to keep paying. I'm going to keep using it. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I was just going to add to that. Like, um, well, a lot of this stuff you do operates on the network layer. So, you know, a lot of that stuff's in front of PGA. So, it, so it's it's clunky to do with open source software. You only have more open source hardware networking designs like what Facebook's doing. With the open computer, is it open computer initiative? Is that what it's called? Open uh, I'm not project. familiar. Yeah. So, what's your question? That was I was just I just wanted to add on. Oh. Add on. Well, like I said, this is I always like to say this is what I did in the time and the knowledge that I had in that moment, right? So, I always look back on this. I'm actually doing a project for my masters to say, hey, was this the best yeah. freaking solution, could or could I have done it differently? Yeah, for a lot of people, I think Cisco is the best solution still, unfortunately. Uh, uh, we don't need to There's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't the place for that, but... Yeah. Uh, you, the call to action, bro. My, uh, my best advice I give people, the best equipment that you have is the stuff that you're willing to work on. So if you're putting in crap that is too challenging for you to use, you're doing yourself a disservice. So work with what you can do. And again, maybe you can't afford this and you're a small network. ACLs are perfectly fine. And most layer three switches have ACL capability. They're a pain when you get bigger, but if you know, you know, you start, like I said, beginning to plan that roadmap, work with your bosses and get there. This is just how I approached it. Because like for me, it's like, well, I know how to do VRFs. I know how to do this. There isn't a document out there that I could find that said, hey, you need to segment your network? Here, you can do this. You can put some stuff here. I was like, so I just kind of started throwing it. I, uh, I talked to Eric in Dallas all the time, Jason sitting right over there. And it's like, you know, we just come up with different ways. Um, so one of the be other best pieces of advice I got, the best network is your people network. Mm -hmm. So I come to these things and I talk to people. So when I need an idea, I just call. Be like, hey, you gave me a ride at that conference a while back. <laughs> so I need some help with firewall. Whatever, you know. Any, anybody else got a question? Yes, sir. When you're moving to a, a fabric of this nature where your network complexity can go through the roof very quickly, how do you balance the segmentation management versus 
for security purposes versus with their engineering team where they may say this is too complex for us to maintain over a long period of time or something goes wrong that we have to troubleshoot. No, and that's, yeah, I think about that a lot. So again, I'm, I always challenge myself. I don't believe in set it and forget it. You'll lose in this world if you believe that. So I always look, are we overcomplicating this? Because again, if it's too complicated, then you're doing yourself a disservice. I don't feel like we're there yet. Uh, you know, there's three networking guys. There's three data center guys. I'm now the IT administrator or the security administrator now. So I've kind of moved. But I feel like we've always hired good people. People that are willing to challenge themselves and research. They pick this stuff up quick, you know, like it's if you, yeah, I think it just comes down to your, like I said before, skills, you know, when you're hiring and uh, someone asks the question, what are you going to do to get management to buy and some of that stuff? You just got to outlast them until they retire. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I do it. You're like, you're gone. Great. I'm going to take this out now. <laughs> so it's, it's a, don't anticipate doing this stuff in one year. Plan it out, piecemeal it. I always say the best plan is the one you're still working on, not the one you're not. So just plan it out. It'll get there. I should probably stop. I think. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>